Standing on the promises Living by faith Standing on the word of God Just follow Christ And he'll show you the way God's people just follow Christ And he'll show you the way this is Pastor Williams of the Union Baptist Church in White Plains, New York. Today is Wednesday, August 26, and our lesson for today comes from James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. This is from the New Living Translation. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. This is the word of God. In most of the commentaries that I looked at, on these verses, verse 8 usually begins the new section. Verse 8 is where we start in our reading today. It says, come close to God and God will come close to you in verse. But as I understand, and no person can decide on his or her own to come to God, that is, we human beings are incapable of um, deciding in and of ourselves to move toward God. And the reason we are incapable is because it's just not in our nature. We need an act of God to do that for us. It is God who initiates our movement towards him. And the Bible is clear in that teaching. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure, end quote. In addition to that verse, uh, we look at John chapter 6, verse 44. Jesus makes this claim. He makes this statement. He says, for no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. So in both of those verses, in Philippians 2.13 and in John 6.44, we are made to understand that it is God who initiates our movement toward him. So for me, the key to understanding verse 8 is really found in verse 6. So you go back to verse 6 where it says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. End quote. Humility is the disposition that precedes our coming to God. To be humble means to realize how weak we really are or to refuse to overestimate our own importance. Yeah, I like that one. To refuse to overestimate our own importance. Uh, humility is acknowledging how helpless we are to change the course of our own lives by our own power. And so the person who is humble before the Lord is the person who bows in God's presence and asks for his forgiveness and asks God to help him or her to trust him, uh, to trust God for guidance. Uh, God then, according to verse 6, gives grace to those who are humble before him. And we thank God for grace. Grace is God's favor toward the unworthy. It is his benevolence on the undeserving. Amen. Thank God for his amazing grace. That's verse 6. When we look at verse 7, verse 7 follows up by saying, uh, So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil. Now, the devil whose sources of temptation are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. You know that already. Those are the three 
great temptations. That Those are the temptations that Satan used on Jesus in the wilderness. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and pride of life. And it's the latter source that we must resist. The pride of life in this occasion, on this occasion, is what we must resist. And in so doing, uh, in prayerful determination to humble yourselves before God, it causes the devil to flee. Now, what the text didn't say, but what we do know is that he flees for a season and he'll be back to tempt you again. Um, so I think it is the act of bowing and humble adoration uh, that we are presenting ourselves to God. And then verse 8 says emphatically, come close to God and God will come close to you. And then it's as if James turns his attention to people whose lifestyle and attitudes show no evidence of having relationship with Christ. Some commentary says that here James began to talk to sinners. And he says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. He says, wash your hands, you sinners. And we're still in verse 8. Uh, the washing of hands is a reference to the laws of cleanliness in the Old Testament. The priests and the Levites who were in God's service were to make sure that their garments were clean. They took extra care to wash carefully their garments and to wash their bodies so that when they became when they came before God in service, they were what we call ceremonially clean. But then James says, not only must you wash your hands, but you must purify your hearts. And the reason the heart needs to be purified and the evidence that it is not is because your loyalty is divided between God and the world. So it's not enough just to be washed on the outside, uh, to be superficially clean. Um, Jesus condemned the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, for that very thing. He said, and I quote, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religion's law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity, end quote. So again, we cannot purify our own hearts. We have to depend on God to do that for us so we can be like David in Psalm 51 when he prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. A pure heart does, is, does not have divided loyalty. You can love the Lord with all your heart. And when you don't, James says you ought to repent. And so in verse 9, James talks about repentance. He says, let there be tears for what you have done. That is, allow your loyalties to be divided. He says, let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Now, to be sure, James is not suggesting that a life of a believer should be doom and gloom. It's a big mistake for us to think that biblical Christianity means a joyous, burdensome, unhappy experience. Because on the contrary, believers should love life and live it fully. We should enjoy the fruits of our labor, enjoy the love of our family and friends. We should enjoy the creature comforts that God has provided and all of the joy and happiness and contentment and blessings with salvation that we experience flow out of our relationship with God our Father through faith in his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, James is saying, you know, humble yourself and if you know in your heart that you're divided, that you have divided loyalties, that you are not loving the Lord your God with your whole heart, he says that is a situation, that is a condition for which you need to repent. So uh, this is talking about humility, the humble heart. He closes in verse 10. 
Um, so this is what I want to say. If you want to be blessed and highly favored, if you want to be blessed beyond your imagination, if you want to experience the tremendous joy that comes with salvation, God's grace gift to you, look at verse 10. He says, this is how you do it. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Amen. Let us pray. God, our Father, we pray that you would create in us a clean heart. God, that you would help us to examine our hearts. And if we find that we have divided loyalties, God, we ask that you would forgive us our sin as we humble ourselves before you. Help us to love you with our whole heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Victorious people.